All right, welcome back. In 2010, I was serving as a special agent with DEA, and I was working out of an office in El Centro. And randomly one day, I got this text message from one of my very best friends, Jimmy Letchford. Jimmy's a former Marine captain, also works for CrossFit in the business department. He was the genius behind Operation Phoenix. Just a great guy. And he sent me this message. And it was rather bizarre what it said. It said, hey, Greg, will you go to Kokoro with me? Well, it turns out I knew that Kokoro meant heart. And so the way I translate this message is my rough and tough buddy Jimmy is asking me to go to the heart with him. I'm like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> so I say, yes, I'll go to the heart with you. you know, okay. Well, I get home that night and I think, oh, I, I should probably find out what I've agreed to. And so I hop on the internet and do some research. It turns out that Kokoro is none other than seal fit. And seal fit was created by none other than Commander Mark Devine, 20 year Navy SEAL, one of the greatest warriors to this day that I've ever met. An amazing man. And what he created was 50 hours of hell. It was meant to exceed the demands of the first 50 hours of the actual Navy SEAL Hell Week. And he created this 50 hours to help prepare prospective SEALs and other Special Forces candidates for the real deal. And does it prepare people? You better believe it. 80% of the people that graduate from his course and then go on to their respective branch of service are also successful. 80%. It's the highest success rate of any preparatory program in the country. And I'd agreed to go through that with my friend, Jimmy, to the heart. Well, I said I would do it, so I showed up. Encinitas, California, October 24th, 2010. It's like it happened yesterday. I remember it so vividly. And I'm standing there in formation with all these other candidates, most of whom are in the military, and most of whom have already been training with Commander Divine. They were ready, mentally and physically. Well, all of a sudden, as if by magic, here comes Commander Divine, and he stands in front of the group, and if you haven't met or seen Mark Divine, his command presence is remarkable. He moves with this element of grace and force that is breathtaking. Amazing, amazing man. And he arrives on scene, he stands in front of us, and then he barks at us this question. He says, what dog are you feeding right now? Hmm. All of the candidates that had been training with Mark, they knew how to answer that question. And they barked back in unison, the dog of courage. Meanwhile, me and Jimmy and some of the other CrossFit athletes were looking at each other like, what is going on? This is not going to end well for us. We have no idea what dog we're feeding. Well, thank goodness that Commander Divine took the time to teach me and Jimmy and everybody else this key principle in warrior culture that is often misunderstood. And it's our job to understand it and more importantly, abide by it. And what he taught me during those 50 hours was that deep inside every single one of us, in our soul, in our spirit, there are in fact two dogs. And each one of these dogs is starving for nutrition. Each one of these dogs is starving for food. One of the dogs is the dog of courage. Very hungry dog. The other dog is the dog of fear. Also a very hungry dog. And it's up to us to feed the right dog. And the right dog, my friends, make no mistake about it, is the dog of courage. That is the dog we have to feed with our thoughts and with our words. And now we go into perhaps what's the most important nutrition of all. Holistic nutrition. The nutrition of the mind, the nutrition of our words. And my friends, this is where it's at. This will literally change your life. This will have the most profound impact 
on your life that you've ever experienced. I mentioned I was serving 2010 with DEA. I had a chance while I was serving with DEA to go back to our home base in Quantico, Virginia. And I went to Quantico because my goal as an agent was to be on what was called the FAST team, F-A-S-T. That stood for Forward Advisory Support Team. That's the equivalent of the DEA SWAT team. And I really wanted to be on that team. And in order to be on that team, I had to go through a 30-day assessment and selection course in Quantico, Virginia in January. <laughs> and as you know, I'm from Santa Cruz. Well, I leave San Diego, California in January. It's 80 degrees. I fly out of San Diego International, 80 degrees. Birds are flying, sun's out, beautiful day. And about eight hours later, I'm in Quantico, Virginia, in the worst snowstorm in the history of the region. It was my first time ever operating in that type of environment. And I was miserable. I was not prepared for that type of environment. Well, I get on scene, and as soon as I arrive at this course I'm going to have to go through, I'm ushered into the small room maybe half the size of HQ. And when I arrive in that room, my name is taken away and I'm given a roster number. My last name is Amundsen, so I am roster number one. It was done in alphabetical order. And I'm waiting in this room for all the other agents who are coming from around the world to arrive. We all have to be there before the course can begin. So there I am standing in this room and in come all these other guys. And guys, what do we do in this type of environment? when we're gonna be testing and competing for a spot on a team. Yeah, the ladies know right away, they're like, oh, I know what you guys do, right? We don't do that, but you guys do that. We size each other up. So I was guilty of that. I'm standing in the corner of the room and I'm watching these people come in. And here comes this great big guy. And I look at this big guy, I'm like, oh my gosh, like that guy has amazing command presence. He is built, he is physically ready for this course. He's gonna make it. And so I want to stay as close to the big guy as I can. A few minutes later, in walks a little guy. Not quite the same build or command presence. He keeps to himself, stands in a corner. And I look at the little guy and I'm like, is he even in the right place? Does he know what this is going to entail? Is he ready physically for this course? Well, the next morning, 4 a.m., we're woken up and all of these candidates these roster numbers are put inside two small white vans. And we're driven through Marine Corps Base Quantico to the first O course, obstacle course, that we're gonna face during this 30-day selection. Now, I love O courses in California. <laughs> <laughs> on a bright summer day with sand on the ground in case you fall. However, this course was, first of all, freezing. Ice and snow on the ground, every obstacle, again, covered with ice and snow. The wind was howling. It's four in the morning, it's dark. You can barely see the obstacles. And so as I'm looking at this course, my mindset, based on what I had learned from people like Coach Devine, was positive. And my mantra was, be careful, pay attention, be safe. That was my mindset. However, my mindset was also, you're here to compete on a team. Do your best. Give it all you got. And stay warm. <laughs> and so I'm jogging in place, hands in my armpits, trying to stay warm. Well, that great big guy I told you about, turns out he is also the senior agent in the group. And because he's the senior agent, he decides he wants to give everybody some words of wisdom, some words of advice. And so here are his words of advice. He says, hey guys, gather in around me. So we all come together, jogging in place, and here's what he says. He says, guys, we've got 30 days of assessment to go. And so whatever you do in this course, don't get hurt. Hmm. My thoughts exactly. So I'm jogging in place, and all of a sudden my mind cues on this advice. Don't get hurt. And I'm thinking, wait a second, we're about to run through an O course covered in ice and snow, and your great words of wisdom are don't get hurt. Part of me feels like I should probably say something. I should interject something positive. But I'm there to compete for a spot on a team. And so who am I concerned about? 
me, my spot on the team, not his. So I don't say anything. Well, the instructor is holding the stopwatch. Guess who decides to go first? The great big guy. Just before the instructor says, ready, begin, and hits start on that stopwatch, this great big guy, he looks over his right shoulder directly at me, and he says this, I just know I'm going to be the first guy to get hurt on this course. And there I am, I'm jogging in place, and I hear him say that, and now I'm really compelled to say something. Part of me wants to reach out, grab this guy, shake him up a little bit, and say, brother, you've got to change your vocabulary. You've got to speak positively. But once again, I'm so focused on my evolution, I don't say anything. Well, that instructor, ready, go. He hits start on the stopwatch, and this big guy takes off through the snow. And at first, it's a beautiful sight. I mean, he is charging through the snow, and he approaches the first obstacle. Obstacle number one is a pull-up bar eight feet off the ground. All you have to do is jump on the bar and make a revolution around the bar. It's a skill we practiced a few months ago at Krav Maga. Well, I'd done it before, you know, in a gym with chalk on my hand. And now we have to do that skill on a bar covered with ice. So I'm thinking to myself, I got to be careful. And I hope this guy's careful. And this guy sprints to the bar. He leaps in the air. He grabs the bar. And this guy pulls off what's known in CrossFit as a reverse muscle up around that bar, which is a legit skill. That takes training. And so now I think, oh man, maybe I got this all wrong. Maybe this guy can't talk to himself, but it doesn't matter because he can sure move. Oh yeah. Then comes the dismount. Great big guy makes the revolution, lets go of the bar, lands in the snow, and ba-boom, breaks his right ankle. Now, this guy's not a doctor, he's not a medic, he's not an EMT, yet when he falls on the ground, he self-diagnoses himself because he falls on the ground, grabs his ankle and says, I just know it's broken. I just knew I was going to be the first guy to get hurt. And so after all that, he is still using his words in a self-defeating way. Well, the medics run over, put a blanket on him, put him in a Humvee and Away he goes. He's driven off the course. Never saw him again. The next morning, 4 a.m., we're at it again. We're back inside those two small white vans. We're driven down a dirt road in the middle of Quantico, Virginia. Suddenly the vans pull over. Instructor says, everybody out. Put on your 50-pound rucksacks. So we get out, rucksacks on. We gather around the instructor. Once again, we're jogging in place to stay warm. And the instructor says, all right, candidates, one of you is gone. Let's see how many you're going to quit on this evolution. Your task on this evolution is to walk down this road and continue to walk down this road until you see another instructor who will tell you this evolution is done. If you want to quit, all you have to do is take off your rucksack, put it in the snow and have a seat. Safety van will pick you up. Drinks his coffee. Good luck. <laughs> Takes off. Well, hey, you know what? I'm a CrossFit athlete. I'm there to compete for a spot on the team. Rucksack's on, I'm off. And for half an hour, my mindset is, ah, this will be easy. This will be over an hour. And I think I'm in front. Well, half an hour goes by, and then an hour goes by. No instructor, and I'm still walking. This is a bizarre evolution. He just told me to walk. Unknown distance, unknown time. Hmm. Well, two hours go by. And my mindset, which is usually, as you know, if you know me, it's, it's usually very positive. All of a sudden, a little negativity started to creep in. And at about the three hour mark, my mindset and my self mantras and affirmations started to sound like this. I must be lost. I must have walked past the instructor. I must have taken a wrong turn. I'm cold, tired. This evolution, this is ridiculous. What's this gonna prove anyway? I should be back in San Diego doing my job as an agent. This is ridiculous. That was my mindset. Four hours go by, I'm still walking. And then I get extremely thirsty. 
Now this is my first time operating in a snowborne environment. So what I'd done is I'd taken my Camelback and I'd put it on the outside of my rucksack. So I go for my straw to hydrate and frozen water source. And then panic sets in, because I think back to my experience in boot camp with none other than Staff Sergeant Oliver, who taught all of us privates that even in the snow, even when it's cold, you can still dehydrate. So now I think, oh great, now I'm going to dehydrate. I might as well quit. And I seriously considered just taking off my rucksack, dropping it in the snow, and sitting down. And when I really started to consider that, I look up ahead of me. And up ahead of me, I see a little bobbing shadow. And I think to myself, well, I'm still in first place, so that little bobbing shadow must be the instructor who's going to tell me this evolution is done. So I muster up what little strength I have left, and I start to jog towards that little bobbing shadow. And I get a little bit closer to that bobbing shadow, and bobbing shadow is wearing a rucksack. And I think, that's weird. Why is this instructor wearing a rucksack? Then I get a little bit closer, and I hear some mumbling coming from that little bobbing shadow. I think, that's so weird. Why is this instructor mumbling and wearing a rucksack? And then I pull up right alongside little bobbing shadow. And I look over. <laughs> Guess who it is? Exactly. It's the little guy. He'd been in front the entire time. And it's not mumbling. He is repeating a mantra. He is saying to himself over and over, I can do it. And he's saying it in what we call in the military a cadence. And so every time a foot strikes the ground, he is saying one of these very powerful words. And so it looks and sounds like I can do it over and over and over. Well, I fall in step next to him, I walk alongside him, and all of a sudden, in my mind, I find myself repeating his words. Now, at first, I'm just saying the words in my mind. I've attached no meaning to them. I'm simply saying, I can do it. No emotional attachment. And then, something remarkable happens. At repetition 9 or 10 of saying in my mind, I can do it, suddenly I believe it. And the moment that I can do it, the moment that became real for me and I felt it, everything changed. I was no longer tired. I was no longer hungry. I was no longer cold. I was no longer even thirsty. All I knew is no matter how long it takes, I can do it. Well, about half an hour later, that little guy and I, side by side, we crossed the finish line. Both of us repeating out loud, I can do it. And the moment we cross that line and secure the evolution, I take off my rucksack and I reach out my hand and I say, thank you. Because if it was not for that little guy's ability to positively influence my mind, I would have quit on day two of that course. And what I found is as the 28 other days went by of continual testing and evolution, every single candidate that made it, as opposed to every single candidate that either failed, quit, or was severely injured, what separated people was not their physical preparation. It was their mental preparation. The difference was that those that made it were feeding their dog of courage. And those that failed were feeding their dog of fear. And it was the same thing when I reflect on my experience at Silfit, at Kokoro. Those that made it were feeding their dog of courage. They were thinking and speaking the right way. And that's the next step. That, my friends, is the final frontier. It's the mental nutrition. And so here's what I want to do. The same way when we talked about our physical nutrition, we broke it down. We got specific. 
we're going to do the same thing with our thoughts and with our words. And so just like there's protein, carbohydrate, and fat, when it comes to our mental nutrition, we need to be doing three things. We must be thinking in the positive tense, encouraging, and optimistic. So let's use some examples of this. One of the examples I want to use right away, because so many of our athletes are working on their double under skill. One of the words I hear frequently in the gym is, oh, I did a set of 50 double unders unbroken. Let's think about that word for a moment, unbroken. Is that word in the positive tense? Or is it in the negative tense? Is that word, even though we might have a good intention with that word, is that word really feeding our dog of courage? Unbroken. What do you think your subconscious mind cues on? The un or the broken? <laughs> exactly. And so let's just put that word in the positive tense. What's another word that could define our intention? What did we really mean to say? Consecutive. consecutive. I did 50 consecutive double unders, as opposed to I did 50 unbroken double unders. And so the key is to bring precision and accuracy to our words. And it's no different than bringing precision and accuracy to the foods that we eat. Our thoughts and words are a very, very potent fuel source. Isn't that awesome? It's like learning a foreign language. This is part of your diet. This is literally part of your lifestyle. Thinking and speaking, encouraging, thinking and speaking with optimism, and thinking and speaking in the positive tense. I was asked to define once, what does positive tense mean? Because we've heard of the negative tense, past tense, future tense. What is positive tense? It's very simple. Positive tense simply means that you think about and you talk about what you want as opposed to what you don't want. Simple as that. Yet, in its simplicity lies extreme challenge. I remember years ago I was doing a private phone consultation with an athlete that that year went to the CrossFit Games. And at the time, this athlete was working and working and working on freestanding handstand push-up. That's an awesome skill. And this athlete desired a phone consultation with me because this athlete thought that the reason they couldn't achieve the skill was they needed additional physical training. It was like me in 2001. In order to win the workouts, I needed from Coach Glassman additional physical training and cues. And he told me, no, 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 you need nutrition. And so when I was listening to this athlete, I thought about Coach Glassman, what would he say? So the question I asked the athlete was, tell me right now, in your own words, what do you want? Just like Coach Glassman asked me, what are you eating? I wanted to know what their physical and mental nutrition was. This athlete said, well, Greg, I want to do a freestanding handstand push-up without falling over. Aha, that's the rub, that's the problem. What was he reinforcing for himself? What did his mind, the subconscious mind, what did it pick up on? What did without falling over equate to? Fall over. And so I said, oh brother, that's not what you want. What you really want is to do a freestanding handstand push-up while maintaining your balance. Got very quiet. And then he said, I'll call you back. 
<laughs> the next day, you better believe he called me back with a lot of good news. What had he achieved? Freestanding, handstand, push-up while maintaining his bounce. What changed? Did I give him physical cues? No. I asked him to change the record that he'd been playing in his mind. Now that's really inspiring because how much time went by? How many times did he have to play the positive record? It was less than 24 hours. That's the power of positivity in our mind. The light will always cancel out the darkness. Feeding the dog of courage even once or twice is more powerful than feeding the dog of fear ten times. That's the power of positivity in your life. And that was a CrossFit Games athlete. We can do that as well. We can use this mental nutrition just like we can use the physical nutrition. And when we combine those two qualities together, when we eat the right foods, and when we think and therefore speak the right thoughts, my friends, get ready for your destiny to be radically shaped. Box breathing. The warrior breath. During Kokoro, during that camp, the seal fit camp, shortly after Mark Devine posed the question, what dog are you feeding right now? He taught me and all the other candidates who were going through seal fit a critical skill. He taught us how to make both dogs sit still. And once the dogs were both sitting still, then we could feed the dog of courage. Imagine trying to train a dog while it's running circles around the house. The first thing you have to do is you have to get that dog to sit still, make eye contact with it, and then you can start to train it. It's the same thing with feeding the dog of courage. Both dogs have to be still. This is how we start every single warrior yoga class. The warrior breath. This is extremely powerful. So powerful, in fact, that speaking about it will not do it justice. We have to experience it. So the first thing we have to do for the warrior breath is we simply have to sit or stand like a warrior. So think about how a warrior would sit. Yes, that's exactly right. So your heels are going to be on the ground. Hands are on your lap. Now, bring your awareness to your low back, your lumbar spine. Maintain that beautiful S in your low back, the curve. And then take your shoulders, roll them back. And notice as you roll the shoulders back, the chest and the heart open. And just place your hands on your lap. Then bring your awareness to your head. You want your chin to be neutral, eyes looking forward, crown of the head lifts up towards the ceiling. Perfect. Now notice that even changing the posture changes the mindset. Isn't that amazing? The body can change the mind. And now our mind is going to further change the body. So we begin by letting all the air out. Just exhale. Now inhale through the nose. Two, three, four. Hold the breath. Two, three, four. Exhale through the mouth. Two, three, four. Hold the breath. Two, three, four. Inhale through the nose. Two, three, four. Hold the breath. Two, three, four. Exhale through the mouth. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Inhale through the nose. Two, three, Four, hold the breath. Two, three, four. Exhale through the mouth. Two, three, four. Hold the breath. Two, three, four. Inhale through the nose. Hold. Exhale. Hold. Continue to breathe naturally on your own, yet maintain that posture just for a moment. 
and feel the body. Feel the power. Notice the mind, the stillness of the mind. Now this is when you are most primed to feed the dog of courage because the dogs are both seated. They're ready for the nutrition that you're about to feed them. <coughs> so what I want to leave you with, and I'm so grateful for this question, Melanie, what I want to leave you with is what in the warrior culture is referred to as first words. It's also known as your morning practice. And so those of you that come to yoga, the way that we always end our yoga class is by practicing what the warriors refer to as their first words. This is awesome. If I asked you this question, what was the first thing you said this morning? Without raising your hands, how many of you honestly can remember the first thing you said this morning? And if you can remember, is the first thing you said in alignment with our holistic nutrition? Oh, I see a few people shaking their head. That's just like waking up in the morning and reaching over and biting into that Snickers bar. And so in the morning when we wake up, I encourage you starting tomorrow, and this will be part of our 30-day challenge, is practice your first words. And this becomes your morning ritual or your morning practice. Ritual, by the way, and tradition, if you've served in the military, you know how powerful that is. Ritual and tradition is so vital in the warrior culture. And you are all warriors. And this is the practice of a warrior. And so the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is box breathing. Box breathing is what Mark Devine calls this. Why? What does the breath do? It makes a box. How many times did we do the box breathing exercise? Exactly. So for my visual learners, this is a great way to remember how to do the exercise. In yoga, we refer to it as the warrior's breath. It's also been referred to as combat breathing. Either way, it's done in that manner. Four counts, four cycles. And what that will do is it will give you that experience you had today. It will really still the mind. And if you do this first thing in the morning, it's even more powerful because you're coming out of what will likely be the longest period of silence you will have all day. And so your mind is already still. <coughs> then you add to that stillness with the warrior breath. And now it's like coming upon a very still body of water in the middle of a beautiful forest. That water is not, it's absolutely still. And then in the stillness of that water, you offer up your first words. And you have to be very careful with these first words because they are so powerful. They are the most powerful words you will speak all day. How many of you have heard that adage, breakfast is the most important meal of the day? First words are the most important words of the day. That is your first mental nutrition meal that you have. And so please be very, very careful with these first words. Ensure they abide by these rules, positive tense, encouraging, optimistic. I just got done teaching this very, very same principle to all the SWAT teams in Washington and Oregon. That's where I was on Tuesday. And I taught them this principle. And I said, guys, if you're in doubt as to what your first word should be, think about that little guy in Quantico, Virginia. If in doubt, waking up and allowing your first words to be, I can do it, great offering of first words. First words can be singular as well. Perhaps you wake up and you just know that day that there's a big challenge that awaits you that day. You wake up and your first word that day is courage. What a great first word if a challenge awaits you.
or it can be in the form of an affirmation or a mantra, such as, I can do it. I'm a Christian, and so many times my first words are repeating Bible verse. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. My God supplies all I need according to his riches and the glory of Christ Jesus. So for you Christians or Catholics, wow, allowing your first words to be Bible verse, powerful, powerful. The practice of first words is awesome, just like the practice of eating the right way is awesome. The nice thing about practicing, and that's the key word, practicing in the morning first words, is that once you're rolling with the positivity, it tends to continue through the day for you. It's easier to sustain and to maintain something than to start something. Imagine that we all had to go outside and push the epic fitness van. And the van's just still. Well, the hardest part's going to be getting the van in motion. But once it's in motion, you can probably put one hand on it and just walk it. Right? Same principle here. So in the morning, just like we want to start our day with a healthy, nutritious meal, because that creates momentum for us. When we start our day with first words and they're positive and uplifting and encouraging, the rest of the words and thoughts that we energize that day are more likely to be in alignment with what we want. 